Hello and welcome to the Bare Metal Programming Series where we're building firmware for a Cortex M4 STM32 microcontroller. It's episode 7. This is kind of like the middle of our communications portion of the series. And in the last couple of episodes we built a UART driver. So the method by which the firmware is going to do a firmware update is going to communicate to the, the computer via a protocol called UART. And we wrote the driver for that in the previous episode. And then we wrote a ring buffer as the kind of storage buffer backing uh, data structure that actually goes to receive the bytes of the UART. Um, so that's great. We've got a method now for exchanging data in the extreme, extremely sort of low level, simple, just sending a byte back and forward. What we're going to do today, or at least what we're going to explore today and then kind of implement over the next few episodes is the idea of building up a packet abstraction. So if we just send bytes back and forward, um, if there are kind of errors in the bytes, then there's no real way for us to tell that. And there's no real way for us to sort of then request that something is done about it right if we even if we can detect that a byte is bad we don't really have a way to say oh no send me a byte again so that's kind of what uh, we're going to solve with a packet format so without further ado let's look at the plan for today and see what we're going to do right so this is episode 7.1 because this is going to be kind of episode seven is going to be our packet episode and we're going to split it across a couple of different parts. So the first one is really going to be about understanding the design of the packet format and understanding the state machine that's going to be sort of the process by which um, incoming UART bytes are turned into packets. So that's kind of the, the things that we want to accomplish today, kind of understanding, reviewing the packet format and getting a good hook on how that state machine is going to work so that when we come to the next episode and we're going to write the code that it's just going to make sense we don't have to worry too much because the packet format is a is a fair chunk of uh the complexity of this project in a way right the 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 state machine which runs that is going to be you know fairly complex um in terms of what we've done so far. So I wanna really be able to focus on the implementation part of that and kind of get all the theory out of the way today. So let's focus on the packet format first. So I don't wanna go through this necessarily. What I wanna do is to go and look at this diagram that I have and we can kind of work our way through and make sure that we hit all the key points. So what you'll see straight away is that the packet is made up of three parts. The first part is the length and that length is not the length of the packet because the packet is always a fixed size, right? It's always going to be 18 bytes, every packet. Um, that length actually refers to how many bytes in the data portion, which is the next set, uh, the next piece of data, how many bytes in that data portion are actually valid. Now, of course, when we, when we have this fixed sized packet, um, sometimes I don't need to send uh, 16 bytes, let's say. Sometimes I just need to send one. Sometimes I need to send five. So that is what this length takes care of us, uh, takes care of uh, here, right? It allows us to just say, hey, there's actually only five bytes in this packet. Okay, so then of course there's the data itself. That's the main sort of, uh, <laughs> the main component of a packet is the actual data you wanna send along with it. So that's what we find in this portion. And then at the end of the packet, there's something called a CRC, which is a cyclical redundancy check. And that's basically a special number that we've computed that is sort of like the signature of these previous uh, bytes. So we can basically, it's almost like a hashing algorithm. If you're familiar with hashing, um, basically you sort of feed these bytes to a stateful algorithm. And eventually you say, okay, now give me the value of that and that's what the CRC is. So you get a number out at the end. Now this number is a one byte value in our case, but CRC is a broad family of algorithms and uh, uh, well, of this, kind of, uh, of this kind of check. And um, it can come in many forms. So you can have CRC eight, which is an eight bit CRC. Um, even within CRC eight, there are variations. You can have 16-bit CRCs, 24-bit, 32-bit, 
anything you like, right? There can, there can be various uh, versions of the CRC. And even within those, there are different uh, types that you can have. And there are different trade-offs for those using any different version. Um, and there are different ways of even implementing uh, different, the same version you can implement in different ways. Now, we're not going to be looking too much at the actual implementation details of CRC, or rather, we're not going to be looking at the way in which it actually works. Like, if you want to understand, like, what do these numbers mean? We put the number in, we get a number out. What does it all mean? Well, there is some underlying concept there. There is a strong mathematical underpinning of what makes a CRC work, but we're not really going to investigate that uh, for now. We will be coming to the mathematics a little bit when we actually get into AES, the implementation algorithm will be, uh, sorry, the encryption algorithm that we'll be using for signing our code. Um, because there is a similarity in some of the mathematics that uh, that is common between AES and CRC. But for now, while we're just focusing on the packets, we're going to be using it as a tool, right? So for us, it's just a machine that we can throw some numbers in and we get one number out and we know we can repeatedly do that on both the firmware and the computer that's sending the, the firmware update. <clears throat> okay, so these are our three parts, right? We have one byte for the CRC, we have one byte for the length, and then there are 16 bytes of data, always 18 bytes total, even if we're only sending one byte of data. So here is an example packet. Um, so in this packet, we've just got a single byte of data being sent. So the, the single byte that we're sending is just C4. Presumably that has some meaning for the receiver. Um, and then what we do with the remaining 17 bytes is we just pad them with uh, FF. So we just put, um, uh, yeah, FF there, all ones. And then finally, what we do is for the CRC, we don't just hash, or rather, we don't just compute the CRC of these two values here. What we actually do is always the full 17 bytes. We always uh, do these full 17 bytes. And in the end, we get a number out. <clears throat> in this case, the number is hex 82. And we just put that on at the end, send the packet out the door. Uh, OK, so what you may notice is that this packet format has some drawbacks, let's say, right? Or at least we can say that it doesn't make optimal use of those 18 bytes that it has. So to begin, um, you may say, I don't always want to send 16 bytes. Like most of the time when I send data, it's going to be in smaller chunks. Like maybe I'm going to send, I want to send eight bytes here and there, or I want to send just like two or three bytes at a time. So kind of the fact that we always need to send uh, 16 bytes worth of data, even if we don't send all of those bytes, right? We don't actually, like only a few of those bytes are valid. The fact that we're going to do that anyway just means that we're sort of wasting a lot of our bandwidth. We're, we're wasting it on padding, right? Um, we're just sending nonsense data. And that's a completely valid concern, right? Um, and well, what we're going to do in this implementation when we come to actually write this is, well, this will be technically just a variable, right? So the number of bytes that you have in this data section can be changed if you want to play around and try some different things. And I strongly advise it actually, like I, I think it's great if you if you are following along with the series that you make little changes here and there and you, you explore different avenues. So if one of those was that you've decided that there should be less data or even more data in the packet, why not? You can do that and you can kind of try to uh, try to get a sense of what the what the implications of that are. <clears throat> so yeah, I don't see that as too big of a drawback. Um, mm. Although I do acknowledge that it's there. Another more kind of, in a way, more major ver uh, sort of drawback is that our length here is one byte wide. And that means that we can represent every number from zero to 255, 256 values in total. But we know that this length can only measure up to 16 bytes. So we've got a whole bunch of, uh, of numbers, four bits in fact, that aren't doing anything there. Like we can count to 16, or we can count 16 individual numbers using just four bits. And then there are another four bits available to do something with. 
So that's assuming that we would never send a packet that has zero bytes in it, because why would you? It doesn't make sense. But if we were to send a, a packet that, that always has at least one byte, then we could use a length of zero to represent that. Like zero plus one gives us a length of one. And we could do that up until four bits, right? So if we send 15 here, that would mean that all 16 of these bytes are valid. That means there's four bits left over. And we could use those four bits for something else, right? We could kind of shrink this length down to half and then use this space for something else. Um, you could do all kinds of different things there, right? You could use that those four bits as kind of four Boolean uh, flags. So if you kind of have oh, like some optionality in this, uh, in this um, format, you might say that if bit one is set or sorry, rather bit, bit seven is set, then it means something special about this packet. You could use the you could use those four bits as a sequence number. So every time that you send a packet out, um, you increase a sequence number. You could use it as a tag. So you could say that there are by kind of like sixteen almost topics that you're discussing in your protocol. And if you set various bits there, then it's almost like those packets will arrive in different uh, almost like different mailboxes. So that's something you could do. And of course, you could almost use it as a as an address, right? So UART is a point-to-point -point protocol, which means that two parties are always connected directly together. There's one transmit line, one receive line. But if you can imagine a daisy chain of, uh, of UARTs, right? So if you have at least two UARTs available on your microcontroller, you could connect uh, one UART to one device and another UART to another. And if you use those top four bits as kind of addressing scheme, you could actually um, retransmit those packets down the line to your next neighbor. So you could actually create a network using this if you were to, to do that. You'd probably want to do something a little bit more sophisticated, but I'm just trying to suggest that those four bits are now kind of wasted in a way. And uh, my answer to that is that it's a completely valid criticism. Um, but my main goal here in these videos, in this series, is not to create the world's best packet format, not to create the world's most efficient firmware, not to make every resource maximally used. <clears throat> My goal is to transmit the main concepts to you, the viewer, in the most effective way. And that, what that means is really distilling the idea down to its simplest form and presenting that. And that's what I've done with this packet format. So. That is why the length is not optimally used here. And it does actually give you an opportunity to try and play around with that, do something interesting. So I do really uh, I do really advise it, just do something interesting with it. Take it away and do something. Finally, um, you could also say that, you know, for instance, like sending all zero, uh, all ones here is not the best idea from an electrical in signal, signal integrity kind of perspective. Um, there is this idea of uh, the DC balance on an electrical line. And that is that you kind of don't want your signals to always be in one state because when you transition, it takes more energy to, to do a transition. So the, uh, the best thing you can do is like the longer you're in a state, the, the more energy it's almost taking to come out of that state. So the idea is that you, you wouldn't want to have um, all ones all the time. Maybe you would wanna you would wanna like have your padding byte be like uh, an alternating one zero one zero like AA or something like that. Um, and to me, this well is a kind of weak concern. I don't think it's a real actually something we need to worry about because this is more something you need to worry about in uh, faster protocols, like when your signals change faster. Um, and you are is is actually a dead slow protocol in the scheme of things. So it's not really a problem, but I mean, I think it's good to think about the possible drawbacks. So that's why I'm presenting it here to you. Okay, all of that out the way. Um, there are There's one more thing to this, and that, that there are two special packets in this system. Um, so there are two packets that have a built-in meaning, even at just this packet level, right? So. You, you can actually do whatever you want. You can stuff whatever kind of data you want and build a protocol on top of this that actually has special meaning. 
but there are two um, which are kind of reserved and have a special meaning. So the first is an acknowledgement. The idea here is that whenever we send a packet, I'm going to send it out and the other side will receive it and the other side will, well actually first thing it will do is to put all of these bytes through a CRC computation and check that what it gets here is the same as the, compu the computed CRC. And if they're the same, uh, that's great. What that means is that packet was valid. And in that case, we can send an acknowledgement in response. And an acknowledgement is simply another packet with a length of one and a first value here of one five. Everything else is FF. And then we compute the CRC for that. And then we send it out the door. So that is um, going to be an automatic process, right? Whenever we receive a packet <clears throat> and that packet, uh, that packet is, uh, is valid, we're going to send an acknowledgement in response. The second special packet here then is a request retransmit. So this is kind of the opposite case. We compute the CRC, we check it against the, the value that we got for the CRC, and they're different. Right, so in that case, we can't trust the packet's contents, right? Or it could just be a completely invalid packet, like there were just UR bytes coming through. They didn't have any real meaning, uh, but we interpreted them as a packet. And in that case, the vast majority of the time, that that you won't accidentally get a, a CRC match there. So, uh, so basically, in that case, we're going to ask them to send the packet again. So in that case, we, we, we do this, we send a request retransmit. And the idea there is that that's also automatic and they have to send a packet in response. So this is, this is the packet format uh, in a nutshell and the two sort of special packets that we need to keep in mind. Okay, so having a packet format's great and let's just make sure I ticked all the boxes here. So we've got 18 byte packet, this is the thing, we have predefined uh, packets. We don't actually have the NAC. That was something that I was going to have earlier, but I think it's simpler to leave it all out. And uh, packets with less data, are, uh, all of that. Yeah, so that's all clear. The next thing we're going to look at is the state machine, the process by which we turn an incoming UART data stream into a packet stream, right? So UART comes in, goes into our machine, and packets come out of the other side. So this is the machine that's going to do that. So this is the packet state machine. We start in this state, and in this state, we're just receiving um, the length byte. So basically, it's going to follow the idea of just bringing the, like individually getting these bytes. Like, are there some bytes available? Yes, okay, got one byte, stuff it in. The, the buffer that says this is the length and move on to the next state. So the first, we just receive the length. Next, we receive all 16 of the data bytes. Then we move to the next state where we receive the CRC. Now at this point, there are three possibilities for what could happen. The first possibility is that we check the CRC of that packet by computing the CRC over those first 17 bytes and comparing it to byte 18. If they don't match, then we request a retransmit. So we actually just send a packet, which is the request retransmit, and then we move back to the first state of just receiving a length byte. So notice in this case, um, we don't actually have to do anything with the packet. We basically drop it, right? Um, we don't have to share that with the consumer of this API, because you should think about this whole idea of packets and formats as an API. And on one side of it, you have something like a bootloader saying, hey, do you have any packets for me? Can I have a packet? Like we would never expect a bad packet to make it to the user. Instead, we can automatically ask it to be retransmitted and then we continue. Okay, so the next possibility is that we check the CRC and it's good, but the packet itself is a request for a retransmit. So they're asking us to retransmit our last packet. 
And in that case, what we have to do is keep a buffer of whatever the last thing we sent was. So we keep a, we keep a little stash of that information around. And then if we ever get a retransmission request, we just send that packet again. So whatever the last thing we sent was, we send it again. And then uh, that flows back through and we go back to the, the receive length state. <clears throat> so again, we don't need to do anything with the packets that ask us to retransmit. We don't need to pass those to the user. Uh, we're just going to do it automatically. We may want to inform the user that, hey, like uh, you've had like five retransmission requests in a row. Like we should be able to ask the question maybe like, hey, do you have any packets for me? Oh, uh, since the last packet that we got, have the, how many retransmission requests have there been? That is something we might want to expose to the user, but we don't ever need to share this packet with them. So we just go straight back to start getting the next one. Okay, finally, and sort of hopefully the most common case is that the packet is just good and it's not a retransmission request. And so it's just a regular packet. And in that case, what we're gonna do is store that into some kind of buffer. Now, I'm not specifying here what that buffer is exactly. Um, it could just be a single, uh, a single buffer, like for a single packet, and that's all we have. Or it could be a larger structure, it could be a ring buffer, it could be a queue, it could be all different kinds of implementations, right? All I'm saying is that we take that buffer and we store it away somewhere. Now, there are then two possibilities, right? So if the packet is an acknowledgement packet, so if it's just one of these, right? Like we sent a message and then we get an acknowledgement in response. Well, an acknowledgement itself is a packet. So if, if it's an acknowledgement, we don't actually need to do anything with that. Um, we don't need to transmit a uh, an acknowledgement in response to that so we just continue and go back to the receive byte length if however um, the packet that we received was an acknowledgement sorry was not an acknowledgement um, then what we're going to do in that case is transmit an acknowledgement in response right because the packet was valid so it's a valid packet <clears throat> we've stored it in our buffer but we can also automatically send an acknowledgement in response. So in that case, uh, it comes down and uh, we just go back into our receive byte length state. Now, what you may want to do is if you have the idea of a not acknowledgement packet, and I may just build this anyway, but if you have the idea of a not acknowledgement packet, um, that would happen when you can imagine we've sent data, um, the data is valid, right? It matches the CRC, but it's kind of not what we expected in the protocol, right? Like uh, we were meant to, like we were expecting a certain response and we just didn't get it. So in that case, what we might do is just send the idea of a not acknowledgement back. And then in that case, you might also not want to acknowledge the not acknowledgement. You might want to do something else with it. I'm going to keep it fairly simple for now. And we'll say that if you want to have the idea of a not acknowledgement, excuse me, if you want to have the idea of not acknowledging an invalid packet, <coughs> then you actually do that uh, in the higher level protocol that you build. So not at this level, not in the state machine. This is actually it. This is kind of how it works. So packets come in, basically this is the workhorse. This is where we receive the data from UR. We put it into a data structure and then we kind of make a decision about what to do with the packet we just received. Are we actually going to take this path, which is where we pass that packet on to the user, or are we going to do one of our two automatic actions, which is basically automatically retransmitting something or requesting that a retransmit take place? And of course, we can also automatically acknowledge packets. Now notice, right, that we do actually pass the acknowledgements to the user um, although I'm not sure we actually need to do that if it's an acknowledgement. The idea is that there was that originally I was thinking that I would have a not acknowledge. And if you didn't, ha if you were, you would want to know whether you had an acknowledge or a not acknowledge. But I would actually like the idea of having this kind of completely automatic. And so I'm going to modify this now. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is that we're only going to, um, we're only going to store the packet 
that we got. If um, if it's not an acknowledgement. So if it's an acknowledgement, uh, sorry, if it's, let's think about this. So we receive a byte via COC. Let's make this a nice bendy line. And then this is the case where it's not an ACK. Set up the font, make sure all of the font stuff is correct. So this is the case where it's not an acknowledgement. Well, in that case, we're going to acknowledge the packet and we store it in the buffer. Let's just put this all together. I really have enough uh, space for all of this here. Like this. If it was an acknowledgement, so in that case, we'll go all the way around. And so we'll do something like this. So this is when it's not an acknowledgement. And when it is an acknowledge, well, yeah, if it's an acknowledgement, then we simply don't do anything with it, right? We're just going to uh, go back here. So I think this is an even better model with no, no uh, explicit need to store the acknowledgement packets. And then what we're doing here is, uh, hmm. Now, now I'm saying this, I think actually it might be better to still have the acknowledge packet come through and to be able to manually deal, deal with it because, hmm, because you might want to wait until you know that your response has been acknowledged before you move on. But then again, I guess that's simply just waiting for the next packet to come through. So I think this can also work. I don't think we need to directly acknowledge packets. All right, I think I'm happy with this. I'm glad that, uh, that I had all of this worked out before we <laughs> came into the video. But this is, uh, it's good to think about this. And I think if you're actually really building a system like this, well, the best thing to do is see if you can just use something that already exists. You don't actually need to build something from scratch. But if you are building something from scratch, I think it makes sense to spend quite a long time thinking about the details of it and the edge cases and what makes sense. And uh, uh, yeah, kind of figure out what all your constraints actually are and use those to guide the process. And in this case, if I'm thinking about the simplicity and I want to drive the simplicity as the, as the driving factor, then I think that this probably makes sense, right? That um, when packets aren't an acknowledgement, that we can store them, we transmit our own acknowledgement, and otherwise we don't need to do anything uh, in that case. We don't need to acknowledge packets explicitly. Okay, um, let's just check that I managed to cover all of these. So in this case, this doesn't actually match because if the packet is not an ACK, send an ACK. Okay, so what we do here is that we have our three kind of main states for receiving. So that's these three states. And uh, when we get the full packet, we compute a CRC we check uh, the packet contents of the length plus the data. Obviously, you don't put the CRC into the CRC calculation. That doesn't make sense. Um, if it doesn't match, you request a retransmission and begin again. If it matches, then you push the packet into a packet buffer. Um, but actually, we modify this and do it like this. So if the packet is not an ACK, then we send an ACK and push the packet into the packet buffer. And then we start again. So that is kind of how the um, how this will work. And I think this is a good design. Okay, so the last part, the last thing I want to talk about today is just how this fits into the wider application and how it fits into the bootloader itself, right? Because it's all well and fine having a packet format, but what is this being used for? What is the information that we're going to drive? And what is the process by which we can do a firmware update? And that's kind of the bigger picture here. So for that, we have another state machine. And firmware 
is often all about state machines. You just you just build all of your processes up in this way, um, and you have lots of these little processes running over time, and those little processes will work together. Like each process can maybe consume something and produce something else, and the production of one state machine can be the the you know the consuming factor for another state machine. And this is kind of a good way of building up a modular set of, um, of processes that eventually turn into your whole application. And that's what your firmware ends up being. It's not the only way to design a program, of course, like there are many different ways to model a program, but this is very, very often used also because it's a good way to put your designs down on paper and use those as communication tools with people around you. So yeah, so that's why we have a lot of state machines and the bootloader state machine is no different. So the first thing that we're gonna do in the bootloader when we load up is we're going to try to wait for some synchronization signal. Now, what does that mean? In our case, what it means is when the bootloader comes online, it's gonna start looking at the UART data stream and it's gonna be looking for a specific series of bytes to come through. No, at this point, we're not looking for packets. We're not actually going through this process yet. And we're not looking at trying to turn the UR into this stuff. Instead, we're just looking for like, say, four specific bytes to come through the UR data stream. When we observe those four bytes, we know that we're kind of in sync with whichever program on the PC is trying to communicate with us. And then we can actually send a, a packet, a synced packet, right? So that's now, there's no synced packet in the, you know, in the format or the state machine. This is something that we build on a higher level. We're gonna say that this specific packet means that we're synced. So we'll send a sync and we would expect then that we get a response which is waiting, uh, which is a firmware update request. So we're, we're expecting the PC is going to say, hey, can I send you a firmware update after we've synced? Now, if none of these steps, if none of, if these steps kind of don't work out, by the way, also this one, if these steps don't work out in a certain amount of time, then we're going to consider this whole process to have timed out. So at each step here, we don't expect that it would take more than however long we say, right? If we say that the limit is four seconds for any given message um, and it takes longer than that, then we're just gonna give up and try to move away from that. So that's a constraint which will need to be satisfied on the computer side and on the firmware side. But okay, we get this uh, firmware update request and then we move to the next state and then it's our responsibility to ask the question, hey, what's the device firmware, what's the firmware ID? What's the device ID for this firmware, sorry. So what this is, what, what we're trying to establish with this uh, request is, is the thing that you're trying to send to me right now, is it actually for me? Am I supposed to try to use this as my firmware? Because it's no good if you have device A and then you get a firmware meant for device B, right? If you put your firmware for your uh, for your um, coffee machine on your washing machine, it's not going to work, right? It's not going to do what you think it's going to do. So this is going to be our kind of um, our way of asking, "Hey, is this meant for me?" And if it is, uh, we'll we'll move on, right? And this doesn't guarantee anything. This doesn't guarantee that there's a program that's malicious on the other side that's saying, "No, no, no! I swear, what I'm going to send to you is meant for you," right? That could still be the case, but we're trusting that if we get a response to this and it matches what we expect, that we can say, great, that's good, we'll move on. So in this case, um, this could both time out, but it could also be that we receive an invalid device ID. And in that case, we would also just stop the process. Okay, so the next thing we'll wanna do is to ask for the length of the firmware. So like, how large is this firmware? And that's gonna be a sanity test for us to make sure like, does this actually fit in the memory that I have available? Because if it doesn't, if it's not going to fit, right? If I say I've got a megabyte's worth of data for you and I've only got half a megabyte's worth of storage, that's not going to work out. So at that point, we can also stop the process. But if all of those parts go through, eventually we're going to get to the state where we receive firmware. So this is going to be that at that point, the 
PC just starts sending out um, packets which only contain firmware information. So you can imagine that in that case, right, we would just have 16 with 16 data bytes at a time with a CRC, and we're just going to be streaming the data out uh, across uh, through to the bootloader. And then eventually the firmware update will complete, right? We'll have received all of the bytes that make up the firmware, and then we will jump to that application. So this is not the final form of our bootloader, right? Our bootloader is eventually going to incorporate the idea of a signed firmware update. And the main process will be quite similar, but what we can do as a final step uh, be between any of these things, right? Before we ever jump to the main application, we will always perform a, a authentication check on the firmware. And we will never ever jump to a firmware that isn't authenticated, that isn't, uh, yeah, that isn't signed. Um, so there'll be an extra process there. And that's something we'll tackle all on its own because it is gonna be a, com a rather complex subject. Uh, but this is kind of going to be the first version, and we're going to be able to see some of the drawbacks by kind of just exploring what happens when we do this. Okay, so, <clears throat> of course, the packets come really, really in, uh, the packets in the packet state machine, they really come into their own here because this CRC is really doing all the hard work for us, right? The worst thing that can happen to us <laughs> is that we receive firmware and somewhere along the way, like some noise happens in the line, we flip bits and we get something in this data that's wrong. Um, this CRC is really gonna save us there because if we see that the CRC doesn't match, we can just request it to be retransmitted automatically. And because of this process, the only time we will ever end up with a valid packet is if it's been checked for the CRC, right? If the packet's bad, it doesn't end up in the buffer. We don't need to do anything with it. We're just going to, this process is going to run and only produce packets in the output stream, which are valid. So this is, uh, this is really great. Um, and, and this also means that, uh, we can, we can know that our, um, that our exchange is working correctly because we always expect these acknowledgement packets and we can build something into the system that can also say, right, hey, I was expecting an acknowledgement, but I didn't get it and it's been this long. So, you know, we're kind of, it's not working out. Um, I'm actually gonna build all of that kind of stuff into the bootloader layer. So you can see that all of these timed out checks, they all happen in the bootloader state machine. But the bootloader is re the state machine is really being fed by the packet state machine. So packets are being uh, created at this point and they're being consumed by this point. So I hope that kind of puts things into perspective. Um, I hope you see why we're even doing this, like why it makes sense to build a packet format. And I hope this has kind of tickled some of the points in your brain uh, as to how we can design such a format and what the trade-offs are and how you might do it differently depending on what your what your requirements are, what you're actually looking to do. So um, I wanna say a big thank you for watching, for making it this far. If, um, if it's all made sense to you or if it hasn't, please leave a comment below uh, or join the Discord server. I'm happy to try and answer some questions about, about the firmware or anything else. Um, and I guess until the next one, Catch you there.